Good evening, West Covina Hills Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am Pastor J.P. O'Connor, lead pastor here. This is Pastor Jillian Lutz. She's uh, associate slash you slash, slash slash slash. Random. There's quite a few slashes. You really are. Yeah. Um, we are blessed and happy to be back here again with you. And we have been just uh, deep into the book of Judges. And tonight we are continuing in the story of mm -hmm. Gideon. And, and uh, wandering off the beaten path of stuff that you hear more often into stuff that's just yeah the, weird. these stories are not going to be familiar to you but that's no. okay um we are going to uh, glean all that we can and the lessons that god has for us yeah pastor jillian would you have our opening prayer sure lord god thank you so much for the weird and complex stories of this part of the bible that you didn't just choose to to have recorded all of the good moments, but also the downright weird, the the strange, and you know, there's stuff for us to learn out of this. So open up our minds tonight as we open up your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are in the book of Judges, and we are in chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading with verse 1. And what we ended with in chapter 7 is the more well-known and popularized part of Gideon's life, which is the defeat of the Midianites, um, and that's what we see. Now, we're going to enter into some details of the defeat, and we're going to see um, a story that is going to come to our attention because the Bible deals with character, not just events. Yeah. And we're gonna enter into the character of Gideon and see a little bit more about the work that needs to be done in his heart and life. Mm -hmm. uh, Judges chapter eight and verse one, the Bible says, now the men of Ephraim said to him, why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. Um, it looks like he's in trouble. Uh, this is like a little revolt here. Uh, Ephraim seems mad that they didn't get the call to help to fight. Um, but the Lord had given him specific instructions. He had whittled his army down. It wasn't like he was just calling everybody to fight this fight anyway. Yeah. But um, th they're hurt because they wanted to be noticed <laughs> they wanted to be they wanted to share in the glory uh, yes and but they did receive some of the glory and Gideon um, I think handles as a leader handles the situation well because he humbles himself and he lifts up the Ephraimites and this is what he says in verse 2 so he said to him what have I done now in comparison with you is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger towards him subsided when he said that. So I, I like this is not um, maybe on the trail of the, the bigger picture of the story that we're going to get into. Mm -hmm. But I, I like leadership moments in the Bible. Mm. And um, I think this is a leadership moment. Yeah. Here he is. He's a leader. Mm -hmm. He's being attacked mm -hmm. personally, questioned about his decision making. And he handles it, I think, in such a positive way. He turns it around mm -hmm. so that the Ephraimites leave feeling encouraged. Mm -hmm. Now, what did he do? He didn't defend himself or justify himself. Uh, he didn't blame them or accuse them. He didn't. Um, he didn't avoid. He simply humbled himself mm -hmm. and said, "Compared to you, what have I done?" Yeah. Uh, you know, I he reminded them of their victories. Yes, and and encouraged them by saying, "You've done so much. Why are you even worried about mm -hmm. what I did?" Uh, yeah. You know, I only had three hundred people with me, but you, you, you took the the two princes. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you killed tens of thousands. We didn't do that. We just blew some horns and smashed some jars and yelled a lot. That's it. That's all we did. Mm -hmm. um, he's undervaluing his part, but by doing that, he uh, builds up. So, I don't know. I, I feel like there's a lesson here about humility, mm -hmm. about leadership that's good. As soon as we feel defensive, as soon as... We're in a situation where we feel like we have to justify ourselves. It usually doesn't go well with the other person. And uh, it's nice to know that it's nice to notice here that Gideon does handle as a leader this situation well. Yeah. Verse four. 
At least that situation. That situation. When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over. I like this. He's still with his core army. Um, it hasn't grown. The original 300 are all there. They haven't lost a man. I think this is a direct continuation of the battle story. This is mm -hmm. like the same campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, the Midianites are running away mm -hmm. and they are chasing them down from behind and they're killing them as the Midianites mm -hmm. run. Uh, that's what's happening. And the 300 now are at the Jordan and uh, they are continuing with Gideon and the Bible says they are exhausted mm -hmm. still in pursuit. Verse 5. He mm -hmm. said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted, and I'm pursuing Ziba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. So um, he's asking for a bite to eat. Yeah. They're tired and hungry. Uh, they've been fighting for hours. They, they've run all the way from, the, from where the battle was to the Jordan River. And now they're crossing over the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in a situation where they're just out of gas. Yeah. And they need something to eat. They need fuel in the tank. They need fuel in the tank. Been there, done that. More than one. I can, I can, I can yeah. get hangry. Oh, can, yeah, 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 yeah. I can yeah, be yeah. that guy that just starts seeing red when he's hungry and he just wants food. Yeah, I was I was feeling foggy before the meal we just came from, and you know, getting some of that paneer in, just like, oh, I'm a human being again. I I had cake at the end of it, and it's like <laughs> making me. It, my birthday cake is making me loopy. So. We just we just had a little staff birthday party for this guy and um, and Pastor Doc. And Pastor Doc. We celebrated both of our birthdays. Yes. So. Um, so what is interesting to me here is that he's simply asking for help, but the leaders of Succoth in verse 6 said to him, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? All right, let me stop here. Um, they do not want to rebel. Mm -hmm. They live closer to Midian. Than, uh, than anybody else. They're right on the border of the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. um, they are concerned about reprisal, that if Gideon can't win the battle, that the Midianites will come back mm -hmm. and will maybe tear down their city or kill their leaders or in, in recompense. So um, on my part, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel a little bit of respect. I respect their position. I think it's fearful of them. Well, the, the but I, I understand their hesitancy to help Gideon without knowing what's gonna how the battle's going to end uh, is what is what's happening. Well, and the other thing that that's easy to miss here, and I missed it until I was just thinking about it, is that bread for three hundred men is no small thing. It's not like they can go to a bakery and buy all of it. This is stuff that had to be threshed in a time of famine, you know, harvested in a time of famine, threshed, made into dough, mm -hmm. cooked over fire um, that you had to go gather your own kindling for. It Making bread was like a daily process that took forever, and mm -hmm. so it's no small ask. I, I just, um, I, you know, we're going to be hard on them. Yeah. Because, number one, God sent deliverance. Uh, yeah. Gideon was his chosen vessel, and the 300 men with him were the chosen vessels of mm -hmm. a victory. I mean, it's a oh, route. Yeah. The Midianites are yeah. running away. The fact that they are not willing to see that the victory is won and that they're still holding back bothers me. But right. I also can respect their position. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? It I does. Mean, I, I know hindsight is easy, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, they're, you know... Uh, they're not faithful. They didn't believe. Uh, but I'm just. And how so... hard is it to just shell out a bit of food? It, it... Harder than it looks on the page. Um. 
I, I still think they're wrong for not right, helping get right. in. Uh, so I'm not Even saying Even on purely that. humanitarian grounds. Yeah, th there's hungry people at your door. Mm -hmm. um, you're supposed to feed them. Um, you're supposed to treat guests like that in, the, in this culture. Culture of hospitality. Absolutely. was a big deal. So the fact that they this didn't is very rude. is wrong. Yeah. It's wrong. But the consequence is not going to match mm -hmm. the crime. And we'll see that, yeah. in, see that in a few moments. So, verse 6, the leaders of Succoth said, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? Obviously, they were not. They're still chasing them down. So, therefore, they're saying no. In verse 7, Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Ziba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with thorns of the wilderness and with briars. <laughs> and he went up from there to Penuel. Let's stop there. He's basically saying, when I get back, with the two princes, I'm going to take your robes and pull them up over your head, and then I'm going to take the wild wild picker bushes with the thorns, and I'm going to whip you with the pickers. I'm going to whip you bleeding with these picker bushes, with these wild vines. Um, it is uh, angry. Yes. Vindictive. Yes. I cruel. Don't know, yeah, cruel. I don't know if you've noticed, but in the book of Judges, there's this principal thread that runs throughout about justice. The mm -hmm. idea that um, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it's very much a, a theme in the book of Judges. Uh, you know, you cut off the thumbs of all these people, so your thumbs are cut off. Uh, you know, going through the different mm -hmm. stories, you'll see a thread of justice throughout the book. You, you abandon me, I abandon you. Well, and one of the one of the themes of the book of Judges is how when it's person on person, it escalates. Mm -hmm. When we get to the end of Judges, we'll see this very vividly, the escalation. But, you know, here it's like, okay, you don't give me bread. I kill it. I, I torture you. Okay. That's escalating the whole tit for tat justice. It's not eye for an eye. No, you no. Know, um, th that's not a fair reprisal, but it says something about Gideon's character that he sees red mm -hmm. and he threatens them in such a violent way simply because they were scared of reprisal and wouldn't mm -hmm. give him bread. That there's something not right in his head, uh, in his character, that needs really needs to be looked at. Like yeah. he sees counseling, hello, yeah. um, anger management, whatever. Uh, but there's definitely issues here. But he's not finished. He actually goes to another place, Benuel, and he speaks to them in the same way. He asks for bread. Hey, we're starving. Please help us. And the men of Penuel answered him the same way that those in Succoth had answered. So they reply the same way. Hey, do you have them beat? No, not yet. We live too close to the border. There's no way we're going to do this for you. We're not giving you bread. We don't want to help the enemies of the Midianites mm -hmm. until you've won, actually won. And so in verse 9, he also spoke to the men of Penuel and said, when I come back in peace, I'm going to tear down this tower. That's their home. Uh, tower is their defense uh, that protects them and keeps them safe. And here he is basically saying, I'm going to tear it down simply because you wouldn't give us food when we asked. Mercy. Um, <laughs> is he right to be angry? Sure. If I'm at your door and I'm mm -hmm. trying to save you, Right? I mean, he's doing it for all Israel, yeah, so yeah. they're included, mm -hmm. and you won't even help. Uh, you're just going to leave him hungry and abandon while he's helping you. Sure, I'm going to be mad, mm -hmm. but the whole idea of tearing down their tower... It's a bit much. It's over the top. Yeah. Um, These are not equivalent things. <laughs> not equivalent things. Verse 10. Now Ziba and Zalmunna were at Karkor, and their armies with them, about 15,000 who were left of all the army of the people of the east for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. So out of an army of 135,000, there's only 15,000 left, and they're still running. Verse 11, when Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in the tents in the east of Nobath and Jogbena, I didn't pronounce that right, but that's all right, and he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. So when Ziba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them. He took the two kings of Midian, Ziba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. So they finally got across the Jordan, mm -hmm. right? They recollected the army. There was about 15,000 people there. And then Gideon shows up with his 300 men, because that's all he has. 
and he's able to rout the final 15,000 people with his 300 men and then chases the princes, Ibn Zalmun, up the road and he captures them. To put this in visual terms, this is like the max quantity that, that our local sanctuary holds against about the holding capacity of the Hollywood Bowl or Dodgers Stadium. <laughs> they shouldn't be able to win a battle. No, like they shouldn't. That's the idea. It is a miracle. I mean, it mm -hmm. is God's blessing. And we shouldn't forget that as we're reading the story as though Gideon and mm -hmm. these 300 men had some kind of skill. They were hiding for years from the Midianites. They didn't have any skill. Mm -hmm. They simply had the blessing of God at this point. And mm -hmm. the Midianites were so scared that they couldn't even fend off um, children with a with a you know plastic sword they were they were dying yeah on it basically um, so Gideon finds them they're unprepared because they think they're safe because they've crossed the river and they've gathered but mm -hmm. uh, Gideon wipes them out verse 13 oh, he takes them prisoner he took the leaders prisoner mm -hmm. um, let's stop for a moment I don't know I, I do know why I think I have a reason why but okay. um, I think he wanted, remember it was Ziba and Zamun in your hand. I, I think he wants to take them prisoner mm -hmm. because he wants to show them. Hey, like, Neener, 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 to, Neener, I got them. Yeah, you want to see them in my hand? Here they are in my hand. Now let me do to you what I promised. I, I feel like the only reason he keeps them alive mm. is because he wants to shove them in the face of the two cities who wouldn't give him mm -hmm. bread. It's just more, I feel like it's road rage. Yeah. Um, that's what I feel like. I feel like yeah. he's getting out of his truck with the baseball bat to smash the window of the guy who maybe was driving too slow or changed lanes in a way that annoyed That's them. exactly what it's like. You know, yeah. it's the death by a thousand paper cuts annoyance until you fly into this murderous. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, first act of road rage in the Bible here is in the book of Judges. And it's, and it's um, by Gideon hero of the lord and of the battle who's in the faith chapter yeah i looked it up he is actually listed in hebrews chapter 11 of the most faithful of god's people <laughs> um pastor jillian was expressing earlier which i i agree with heartily is that a lot of the people that are listed in that chapter in hebrews chapter 11 are bad character people um but they trusted in the lord <laughs> And the, the Lord is gracious uh, to us and to them. Thank God. Do you want to, are you going to look at the list? I'm just looking at it really quickly. Let's see here. It's the first the two, a Abel, Abel and Enoch. Okay, they, they're pretty decent dudes, but Noah was a drunk. Uh, Abraham basically raped a concubine to solve his own fertility issues. Isaac lied to Pharaoh. Jacob lied to a lot of people. Um Sarah forced someone to take her place as a surrogate mom. Um, yeah, there's just... Uh, oh, okay, Joseph was a decent guy, although he was a bit arrogant. Moses killed a guy. She's being um, a negative Nelly. I mean, you are listing off all the weaknesses and faults of every person on that list. But Rahab was a prostitute. Each of them did good stuff, too. You can't exactly. Just, yeah. And so the, the one of the one of the most beautiful things about this faith chapter it's tempting to treat it as like a hall of the absolutely amazing but they're all hot messes too and god counts their good deeds you know to remember mm. them in history rather than their spectacular failures and god is honest and lists listed lists for us all of them uh, he shows their weaknesses on purpose. Yeah. So that I, I hope that we would find encouragement that even though we are weak and faulty, that God can still count can us still as faithful, count us as, even yeah. though we fail spectacularly sometimes. Every once in a while, you know. I said sometimes. <laughs> I said sometimes. Not often, you know. Uh, uh, you know, every other day, you know. Please, okay. Uh, verse thirteen. I have a very dark perception of human nature <laughs> uh, probably more honest than mine <laughs> so verse 13 then Gideon the son of Joash returned from the battle from the ascent of Harris and he caught a young man of the men of Succoth and interrogated him and he wrote down for him all the leaders of Succoth and its elders and its 77 men so 
His army's coming back, his 300 men. He's got the two princes in his hands. And he finds a young man and he interrogates him for the names of all the leaders of the city of Succoth. Which would have been the ones who denied them bread on the way over. Yeah. Revenge. Uh, I remember uh, the old movie uh, Star Trek II and Wrath of Khan. And, Ooh, the Wrath know, of Khan. Revenge is a, it's a dish goodie. best served cold. Yes. Uh, you know, you can feel that he... I mean, he. where's the victory dance? Where's the joy over the Lord... Uh, giving victory to the army. Where's the praise? Where's the... You, mm -hmm. All you see here is vengeance and anger. There's something wrong in his head. He cannot remember that the God, God has given victory to his people. Finally, mm -hmm. they're out of the hand, un, out from under the thumbs of the Zibionites. Uh, Midianites. Uh, Midianites. I, oh, I, I, there's a lot of Zs in this, in this chapter. Um, so I, I, just, I just feel like... Uh, that there's in his in his brain, it's not ticking. He's not seeing things clearly. He's just seeing red. Um, interrogating the youth. I mean, are they just like, hey, you know, give us the names of the seventy-seven elders of your city? Would you, you know, interrogating? What does that mean? They got this young person, and for some like, reason, I've got images of like Guantanamo in my head. Yeah, yeah. like waterboarding. I don't know. I mean, what what's the? How does this? If I was. If I was the young man, I wouldn't remember all 77 names of the elders of my city. I probably, I don't even know who the mayor of my city is. So that says something, right? I don't remember who West Covina mayor is right now, which is really bad because I do invocation for city council <laughs> on the regular. <laughs> well, I'm, okay, in my defense, I'm on like my third or fourth mayor at this point. <laughs> so in verse 15... <laughs> He came to the men of Succoth and said, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you ridiculed me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your weary men? See, there's that thought process of mm -hmm. he took them alive only so he could shove them in mm -hmm. their face. Verse 16, he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them... He taught the men of Succoth, which means he whipped them. Seventy-seven people, and he whipped them with thorns and briars. Uh, cruel, <sighs> heartless, angry. Verse 17, then he tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. He didn't just do what he promised to do. He escalated it even further. He goes even farther. His anger gets out of control, and he doesn't do it all himself. He's got his 300 men, but what's his example? What kind of leader is he? That after a victorious battle, they go back and they kill their own people because of a slight. He's being a ber berserker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like bloodlust. You know, yeah, just... yeah. My... So something I've been doing to keep myself entertained towards some of the during some of the more monotonous forms of baby care has been to listen to um, kid-oriented history, history lessons. And I've, I've been learning about the Vikings with little Matthew lately. Mm. And there were these Viking soldiers called berserkers who would go into like this murderous trance and kill everything in sight. Um, and it feels like he's doing that here. Like he, mm -hmm. he's gone into this sort of murderous trance. Mm -hmm. Come to think of it, even though there's no swear words in it, it's probably not the most, you know, baby uplifting thing to be listening to. Like, there's another fi historical figure in there who liked Gideon, Olga of Kiev. Um, this one guy killed her husband and had the idiocy to propose to her. And so in response, she burned to death two different delegations of 20 men. And when she got over to... When she got over to um, the... When she got over to his city, supposedly agreeing to the proposal, the, she then like burned the city down with, with the guy inside it. Good lessons uh, for life. <laughs> right, right? And this is what Gideon's doing here, you know, that, that thirst for vengeance out of proportion. Verse 18. So he, and this is still talking about Gideon, said to Ziba and Salmona, what kind of man 
were they whom you killed at Tabor? Ooh. And they answered and said, as you are, so were they. Each one resembled the son of a king. Um, okay, so basically now Gideon is turning his attention to these two men because he's mm -hmm. moved on from his revenge and his uh, merciless torture of the mm -hmm. and then the killing of everybody in the city. I mean, just horrible. And now he's turned his attention on the princes and he's asking about a specific town, city, and he wants to know about Tabor and they actually remember. Yeah, I remember Tabor. Um, the people that were there were like you. And then in verse 19, Gideon said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. So he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw a sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. Okay, there's a, there's lot. a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to unpack. First of all, he's, he's digging into them because his family was in that city. And now he's finding out that these Midianite rulers even remembered killing his family. Yeah. So now that it's escalating. His anger is just moving. It's rolling like a snowball down the hill. And incidentally, as someone who has lost a brother, I kind of get where he's coming from. That, that sort of sense of, you killed my brother, prepare to die. Mm -hmm. Now, now you know, there's no one on the other end of my particular angst about this other than, than my idiot brother himself. Um, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> because we had a conversation about it, it was totally his choice to go on the hike there is no person alive who I can be angry at um, for the death of my own brother but if he had been murdered instead of just died on a dumb hiking accident that was totally his fault in the first place um, I might kind of feel this way even mm -hmm. if I don't actually do anything <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely but the, it gets interesting because he tells them that he might have kept them alive if he hadn't killed all of his family. Why would he keep mm -hmm. them alive? I mean, the Lord had given the Midianites into his hands, and they were, they were terrible. I mean, we talked earlier about what the Midianites were and mm -hmm. the torture that they brought upon God's people. Why would he even keep them alive? They deserved death, and God had given them into... Mm -hmm. Now he's thinking about keeping them alive? For what reason? What is going on in his brain? But basically he's saying now that you're going to die because you did that. No, they're dying because God now is defending his people finally. They, they deserve to die because God has passed his judgment upon them mm -hmm. and they have been found wanting. Their, their choices, their character have showed that they are outside the realm of divine grace and they deserve divine judgment instead. Uh, but not Gideon in his head now is playing God. Mm -hmm. He's deciding whether they live or die. He's deciding whether his people live or die. Mm -hmm. um, his brain is not working right. Uh, so then, to add insult to injury, <laughs> he turns to one of his young children and says, kill them. Which I don't even understand. Just take your own sword. He's trying to humiliate them. To have a little child kill them. But the child yeah. is so young... He's traumatized, he's as he should be. He's crying, maybe? I mean, I can yeah. just imagine it, right? But, Daddy, I don't want to kill them. Ay, ay, ay. This is yeah. such a mess. On the, on the child's history of the Vikings, so child-friendly, um, in the story of Olga, who we just mentioned, there's a little child voice that comes in. Now, Mommy, you already, you already, killed, you already killed the first delegation. Do you have to kill the next delegation? And it just goes on and on and on. Like, do you have to do that? <laughs> Verse 21, so Ziba and Zalmunna said, rise yourself and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and struck and killed Ziba and Zalmunna and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks, which were very heavy and were made of gold. So mm -hmm. ultimately, finally, the Midianite kings are dead, but it's not clean. No. It's messy. No. And the Bible's being honest and open about Gideon's own journey Mm -hmm. In being a leader and being um, being called of God, mm -hmm. and it's a messy journey. Yeah, um, I think a lot of our lives are messy too. Oh, absolutely. Um, doesn't fit neatly into what we think God wants. Saint want. or sinner. Yeah. Um, but I think also it gives me encouragement that if somebody like Gideon 
can find grace in God's eyes, then um, it's possible for me also to find grace in God's eyes. Plot twist on, on Olga of Kiev. She later became a Christian and revered as a saint in Eastern Orthodoxy. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Just like Gideon is in the Hall of Faith in, the, in, in Hebrews Olga 11. Olga is a saint. Saint Olga. Saint Olga of Kiev. <laughs> Would you have our closing prayer, Pastor Joel? Sure. Lord, life is messy. People don't always do things for the right reasons. But somehow you work through us. Lord, purify our motivations. As we go, as we go about the different things where sometimes our passions and your will align, let us stay aligned, not just to the outcomes that you wish to see, but also to your motivations for them. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a heart like yours so that when we need to do the difficult things, we do not do it out of a sense of vengeance or rage or cruelty, but out of a sense of humble obedience towards you. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. See you next week. <laughs>